Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Mihaela. Uh, I work uh, at Facebook right here in this building. Um, and uh, I work on Litho, which is an Android UI library which we open sourced, I think, a couple of years ago. Um, today, specifically, I'm going to talk about the threading model of Litho. Um, how many of you have, you, uh, have heard of Litho before or used it? Or? OK, so a few of you. Um, for, those, for those of you who, who don't know what Litho is, uh, it's a declarative Android UI framework, uh, which is heavily inspired by React. Um, this is kind of what it looks like when you write the layout in Litho. So you don't use this XML to describe your layout. Uh, you use these um, special annotations on Java classes to basically describe what your layout is going to be composed of. Um, from this, um, from this layout, um, we use an annotation processor to generate a class that we call a component, which you can think about as a pure function. So it takes immutable inputs as props, which we declare with a special prop annotation, and it spits out uh, output in the form of uh, immutable uh, layout. Another feature of uh, Litho uh, is that it automatically flattens view hierarchies when, wherever possible. Uh, so it's not uh, tied to the um, Android view system uh, layout, uh, but it uses Yoga as a layout, a layout engine, and that unlocks a bunch of possibilities for us. So uh, traditionally in, in Android, when you render a, a layout on screen, you have to uh, keep around the entire view hierarchy. Um, even the containers, which don't actually render anything on screen, you just use them to position other views that you actually want to render. Well, Litho gets, used, uh, gets rid of all those containers that we don't actually need to display content on screen. So this is the comparison of um, the same layout, uh, which is displayed with um, traditional Android views um, compared to Litho components. So you see that basically whatever doesn't need to be uh, drawn on screen, we strip it off. Um, there is an exception, uh, as always. Um, if um, any of these views must be interactive, uh, we still wrap it in a view because we didn't want to like, reinvent um, our uh, click handling system. Another special feature of Litho is a fine-grained recycling system. So if you're familiar with the way uh, that a recycler view recyc recycles views um, in Android, uh, you'll know that you, you have these view types, um, and recycler view keeps um, a pool of, of views for each view type that you declare. So basically, if you think about Newsfeed, um, Newsfeed is a massive recycle view. Um, each story um, is a different view type, each type of story. Um, so you can imagine that when you have such diversity in your view types um, in a list such as, uh, such as Newsfeed, uh, this kind of recycling is not very effective anymore. So think about one of your friends gets married, right? You see a life event story. Chances are, as you start scrolling, you're not going to see another one. Um, in, the life, in the lifetime of that recycle view. So uh, what Litho does is instead of recycling on the view type level, it recycles on the finest uh, possible component that we can put on screen. So this is kind of what recycle view recycling looks like. And this is the Litho recycling. So it recycles on the text level, on the image level, on the finest component you can actually mount on screen. And the last feature that I'm going to talk about today is uh, performing, background, uh, performing layout on a background thread. Um, so uh, the background scheduling um, that we do in Litho, uh, we can do it because um, we always work with immut immutable data. Uh, so um, we are not tied to the, uh, to the UI thread as you would be in a, an Android view, uh, view system. Uh, and um, the measure and layout step uh, of Litho can always be done on a background thread wherever possible. We are only tied to the UI thread uh, for the draw step because we still work with views and drawables for that. So I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, give um, an overview of uh, what the scheduling uh, of background layouts looks like in Litho today and how we plan to improve it because it doesn't cover all the possible use cases. So this is the sample app that we have in our open source repo. It's not very glamorous, but it proves the point. Um, let's see what happens when we um, enter a list surface um, the first time, and what happens as we start scrolling through that list. So this is kind of what the sample app looks like, just so you have an idea of all the examples I'm going to give later. 
Um, under the hood, to display this list, Litho still uses a recycle view. Uh, the items that we display um, inside that recycle view are, are the special views that we call Litho views, uh, which are views that are capable of hosting components inside of them. Uh, this is a screenshot of what this actually looks like, um, like the view your key looks like uh, with Flipper. Um, the recycle view uh, process of binding the litho view um, and re rendering it is still UI bound. The process of calculating the layout for the component that we host inside the, uh, that uh, li litho view doesn't have to be UI bound. We can do it on the background thread wherever, wherever possible. And we still always go back to the UI thread to actually mount that litho view on screen. So the whole thing of recycle view doing on bind view holder and actually putting the content on screen, that's still UI bound. But we can uh, always uh, calculate the layout for the component that we host for it ahead of time on a background thread. So this is uh, an overview of what happens um, when we decide to schedule something on background thread versus on the UI thread. Um, we, um, as you open the list for the first time, um, we always calculate the layout for the first item in the list on the UI thread. And that is for two reasons. Um, when we uh, schedule the um, async layout calcula calculation, we need to know how many items we want to be able to pre-compute. If we pre-compute the entire list that we're going to host um, inside our recycle view, that means we're probably going to over-compute and overload our memory because chances are we're never going to scroll to the actual bottom of the list. So we always want to be cautious about how many items we pre-render, we pre-calculate um, in our range. So what we do, it's not very scientific, but it works. We um, always uh, do the layout for the first item uh, synchronously on the UI thread because we need a measurement immediately. And based on the measurement of that first item, uh, we estimate how many items we can possibly fit in the viewport. So let's say we have 10, 10 items in the viewport. Then we use something called a range ratio. Um, and based on that ratio, uh, we keep as many uh, screens worth of items above and be below the viewport pre-computed. So let's say you gave your list a range ratio of two. That means we're going to keep two um, screens of pre-computed items of, uh, above the viewport and two below. So when you actually start scrolling the items, um, when the recycle view needs to put something on screen, you don't need to calculate that layout right before you put it on screen. It's going to be pre-computed somewhere in the list, so we can just render it, basically. So this is what happens. We, we have uh, computed the layout for the first item synchronously on the UI thread. We have the size of our pre-computed -com pre range. That means we can uh, then, from the UI thread, schedule um, an async layout calculation on the background thread to calculate the number of items that we decided uh, in this step. Um, at the same, same time, in parallel, on the UI thread, um, the recycle view wants to have some content on screen. We've already computed the layout for the first item, so we have it ready. We can just render it and mount it on screen immediately. But then it's going to go to the second one. And this is where it gets um, a little bit tricky. Um, when, the, uh, when the recycle view wants to put the second item on screen as soon as possible, we look to see if, we've, um, if there was a chance that we maybe pre-computed that item on the background. And if we did, uh, we can just mount it immediately. If we didn't, because the recycle view will have to uh, synchronously render something right then, um, what we used to do uh, was we would just schedule that, that layout from scratch on the UI thread, just so we have some content to show on screen as soon as possible. So we would uh, then finish the layout synchronously on the UI thread and then go ahead and mount it. If the item was pre-computed and we already had a layout for it, we would just mount it immediately. Um, this, is, um, this is not great. So this is kind of what it looks like if we take a sysrace of that. Uh, this is the first item that I was talking about. Um, you can see from the trace that as soon as we finish the layout for it, uh, we can go ahead and schedule the async uh, layout, uh, the calculation for the async range on the background thread, which we call the component layout thread. Um, then, uh, in this step here, this is the recycle view trying to uh, render some, some content on screen. This is the mount call for the first item that we already had. Uh, when it's done with that, it's going to want to mount the second item. And then it goes back to the background thread, and it asks, do you have a layout for it? Um, as you can see here, the second layout is pretty long. So when we actually need to mount it, uh, it's not finished yet. It's only finished somewhere over here. But we need to mount it here. 
So then you can actually compare the IDs. This was, this was built for like a bigger screen, so I hope you trust me when I say this is the same layout. Uh, <laughs> so um, what happens now is the UI thread is just going to pick up the same work that we were doing on the background thread. And then it finishes, and then it mounts, and so on. Um, in, the, um, in the meantime, uh, the component layout thread, which is the background thread, keeps scheduling uh, layouts asynchronously uh, for this pre-computed range that we keep around. Um, this, is, um, this trace is taken when you load the screen for the first time. What happens is that um, eventually, uh, sorry. Eventually, the, um, the background thread is going, to keep, um, is going to catch up to the UI thread. So um, when you actually start scrolling the list, um, all these um, layouts that you are going to have to bring up on screen from below the viewport, you're already going to have them pre-computed. So um, even if this approach wasn't great, it was good enough for the scrolling purposes. So if you just wanted to improve the scroll performance of your app, it was good enough. But of course, as you can tell, this is not what we want. So we're wasting a lot of resources because what we're basically doing is calculating the same layout twice on two, two different threads. This introduces contention, and we're basically just wa wasting resources. Because once the UI thread starts scheduling it synchronously, it, this one from the background thread is basically just thrown away. So that's when we came up with a concept that we call the shared layout future. Um, now we have a system where we, um, we ma made it possible to detect when the same layout was being scheduled on two different thread at, uh, threads at the same time. So um, compared to the diagram that I showed you before, what happens now um, is if the UI thread needs to mount something on screen um, immediately as you first render the recycle view, um, instead, of, um, instead of starting that layout from scratch, what it's going to do is um, the UI thread is just going to block and wait for the, background, for the layout from the background thread to finish. So as a comparison, a sysTrace will look something like this now. So uh, we mount the first item that we already have calculated synchronously, and then we schedule the async range on the um, background component layout thread. And at this point here, the um, a recycle view is going to one amount the second item. It goes to, to back to the background thread. It sees that the same layout is already in progress, so there's no need to actually start that layout from scratch on the UI thread. So we just block the UI thread until this one is done. And then when it's done, we can go back to the UI thread and just mount it as normal. Um, this showed massive performance improvements for us. So um, even though it's not ideal, you still save all that time uh, that you would have wasted uh, since you started the layout on the background thread until you uh, restarted on the UI thread from scratch. And of course, there's less contention. So uh, the background work actually finishes a little bit earlier if the UI thread is just idle doing nothing. This is still not great. Uh, we're using, we're um, losing parallelism. Um, and at this point, the background thread, um, even if we bump up the priority as much as possible, it still doesn't compute layouts as fast as um, the UI thread. So we ran some experiments to see how much faster the UI thread can compute layouts compared, compared to the background thread, uh, which has the same priority as the background thread, and it's about 10% slower. So um, I guess Android still favorizes the UI thread in some ways, so the background thread is just never as fast as the UI thread. And of course, we're wasting so much opportunity when we could just be doing work in this time here. Um, so uh, the part, uh, the, the stuff that we are working on now is actually being able to uh, interrupt the layout wh while we are resolving it for a component and move part of it to the UI thread when we know uh, that we actually need it immediately to mount something on screen. So this is the part that changes now. Um, what we are doing at the moment uh, is when we detect that we need to um, mount the layout for an item that's already being computed on the background thread, uh, we don't block the UI thread anymore. What we do is we interrupt the background thread as soon as possible, and we just take all the remaining work and we move it to the UI thread. <laughs> 
So it looks something like this now. Um, this is uh, the big component that I showed you earlier. Um, this is the part where it just computes the layout for, um, for the image. And then the UI thread goes and says, I want to mount the second item, which the component layout was busy executing. So instead of waiting for it to finish the entire thing, it just interrupts as soon as possible on the background thread, and it takes the rest of the work and it moves it and finishes it on the UI thread. At the same time, the component layout uh, is now free to just move on and um, calculate the layout for the next item in the list. So that just um, propagates in a cascade of just starting all the layouts a little bit faster. Um, because this one will start uh, earlier, which increases the chances of it already being ready when we need to mount it on the UI thread. So uh, this is something that we're experimenting with now. Uh, there are still a bunch of issues with it, as you can imagine, but we hope we're going to have it ready pretty soon. So um, this unlocks parallelism, which we were losing when we were just blocking the UI thread to, finish the, to wait finishing the work from the background thread. And we also always, uh, whenever uh, we need um, a layout urgently, synchronously, because we need to mount something on screen, we can guarantee that it's going to be the UI thread computing the layout for that item. And as I mentioned, this also increases the chances that the background thread is going to already have work ready for the UI thread when it's going to need it, because we just move everything to be executed faster. Um, you might be asking at which point do we decide that we can interrupt the layout when it looks something like this. So let's say you have a declaration for your component that looks something like this. Uh, we have um, the column and the row that you see here. Th these are layout components. They're kind of the equivalent of, um, of a linear layout in Android. So the column just displays, um, arranges items in a vertical fashion and the row horizontally. So if we have a column with two children, and the second child already has, also has children uh, in its turn, let's say um, as you are resolving the component number two, the UI thread um, in, um, needs to put something on screen, so it interrupts the background thread. At that point, um, that means we already got to compute the layout for component one and component two on the background thread. Um, we keep them around, and then we just mark component three as being unresolved, and component three's layout is going to be executed on the UI thread. Any questions? Hi. Um, Hi. You talked about the, a couple of methodologies that didn't work with your product there. Um, did you release any of those into the, the new stream, or did you wait until you'd iterated over f all three ideas before releasing them? Um, are you talking about anything in, uh, in particular? Uh, can you just remind me? Uh, yeah. Uh, as, as I saw it, there were, there were three builds of this idea. Yeah, so uh, the current state uh, is that we uh, simply make the UI thread uh, block and wait uh, on the result from the background thread. So that's um, all released in the open source repo of, of Litho. And this other idea we're experimenting with now, uh, it's not completely stable, but the code for it, is, uh, you can just enable, enable it as an option if you just uh, fork the repo. So it, the code is out there. We're just trying to make it stable. OK, cheers. Any more for any more? Uh, oh, let me run. Thanks. Um, I I never used first of all I never used the this library, but I I got quite curious with the idea of <coughs> recycling uh, the smaller components. Mm -hmm. Does it? cause the adapters to get very confusing and complex? Well, we actually have a, uh, we don't use view types in, uh, in the adapters. We have one single view type, which is uh, our, our view holder is m just creating little views. Uh, and then the little view itself can host different components, and we recycle on the component level. So we, we keep um, a pool of components for each component type that we have. Um, don't imagine that uh, we now have a pool of components that are the equivalent of view groups. Uh, we only keep pools for like primitive components, such as text and image and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? 
So you mentioned that some interactive components were still wrapped in a view. Can you explain um, what these are? Uh, so for instance, when you, when you want to interact with a component on screen, let's say you have an edit text, for, ex for instance, or uh, you want to uh, trigger an event when a user clicks on one of your components. So to be able to handle um, click dispatching and handling, we still wrap everything, like the component that you want to interact with, it's still wrapped in a view, because we didn't want to have to implement our own click handling system or other like, interaction events. So what was your approach to making the Android UI um, framework uh, immutable? Um, immutable? Um, well, <laughs> we, say it's, um, like we say we enforce immutability, but that's always in the hands of the developer in the end. So uh, for instance, uh, what's in the hands of our framework, which is rendering the components uh, and um, creating the layout, we make sure that's immutable in the sense that, uh, for instance, let's say you want to display a text component on screen. And then you want that text to be um, able to update based on some value that comes down from the server. Well, in order to update that component, uh, it's the same as you would do in React if you're familiar with the paradigm. You cannot just set that text on the component. You would have to recreate the entire component hierarchy with new instances of the components which are going to be part of, um, uh, of your hierarchy. So every time you need to update something on screen, we create new instances of uh, everything that makes up the component tree. But then again, if you pass data uh, to that component that is mutable, we don't really have any way of detec de detecting and handling that. So you could have um, like a wrapper text uh, that's passed this prop to your component, which you can mutate from outside. And then things can go bonan bonanzas, because we don't do anything about it. We have a question over here. Yes. So um, how do you manage to, you, um, you said that the, the deve in development version will uh, basically share um, the incomplete view calculation between threads. How do you, how do you manage the loading and saving between, um, of the state of the, the currently loading view between the, the threads? So um, they're not views. Uh, that's the thing. Um, under the hood, um, the layout for these components is represented using yoga nodes. Um, and um, they always, um, when you calculate the layout for a hierarchy of, a comp uh, for a hierarchy of components, uh, it reflects in a hierarchy of layout outputs. Uh, and we are able, as we compute this hierarchy and we resolve what each component should, uh, should look like on screen and what its size should be, where it should be positioned, we can always interrupt com uh, computing these yoga nodes at any point we want. So we can serialize it, basically. Sorry? So you serialize the, the computation uh, results. Yeah. Uh, in the end, that's actually exactly what we do. So we have uh, a tree of layout outputs, uh, which is the description of what, where your components should be rendered on screen and, and everything. And then we go through this tree, and we do exactly that. We make a list of it. So in the end, it's just a list of outputs. That's why we can actually strip away containers and everything. It doesn't have to be um, a tree in the end. It can just be a list. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Okay. I think that might be it then. Right, can we have a big, big round of applause for Mahela, please? <laughs> <laughs>